to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the Amp TV studio, Double AMP TV. Today's show is brought to you by UppercutChops.com. Check out their tasty selection of all-natural, dry-aged, USDA prime Angus and Wagyu steaks and chops. Wait till you try their best in class New York steaks, the filet mignon, and of course the king of all, those massive cowboy cut and tomahawk cut ribeyes. Best I've ever had. Probably be the best you ever had as well. Wait till you try those prime Wagyu burgers too. Wow, they're incredible. Check them out at uppercutchops.com. That's uppercutchops.com. Or give them a call and find out what's for dinner. 702-799-9935. 702-799-9935 for uppercutchops.com. Yes! All right, a big welcome in to everybody listening in on our CBS, NBC, and Fox Sports affiliates and independents from coast to coast. Everybody watching on social media. Thanks for watching us on Pick Your Favorite Medium, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. We're there. You can't get away from us. Also on Hotel TV in over a half a million rooms from coast to coast, plus Cox, Comcast, Spectrum, Frontier, Time Warner, and WOW Cable affiliates. And we are here with our baseball insider, world champion, all-star third baseman, 21-year veteran player, plus a couple of decades in coaching, and that would be the great Daryl Evans. Daryl, thanks for joining us on today's show. Yes! Hey, hey, Sam. Finally got back with you. How you doing? I'm doing great. Everything's great. The only thing we're missing for everybody on TV, we can't see your face, so we're going to go to a split view on the camera, so at least they can see my giant cranium, if you know what I mean. <laughs> if they want anyway, so, you know, they... they... They can always go to the baseball cards and all that if they can remember, you know, remember what I used to look like. Well, you still pretty much look the same. Well, you know what? It's fun. It's funny that you said that because I've been catching up with a bunch of my buddies lately. I mean, just uh, kind of by accident. But, you know, we've lost some guys and, and, you know, all teammates and all that. So it's a great excuse to go back to that. And... um, we all kind of talk about that, you know, because we remember each other from the good old days. And shoot, then it's, you realize it's like 30 years, 35 years. And, and um, you know, I still get uh, base. I mean, people see me cards to sign. And, and so it, it takes me back there. You know, I don't really think about it. And, and heck, I'm, I'm looking from inside. So, you know, I don't really know that I'm, it's the reaction of the the other people so they seem to be, be okay with it so i'm good with it you know i'm i'm still young and uh and uh, sarcastic and all that kind of stuff that i love and uh, keeps you going keeps you young and, and and look forward to it and uh and then we get to go out and talk and tell our opinions like like on this show and and have fun with that so you know, yeah. we're still involved in baseball that keeps i think that keeps us all young i think it does and you know i was rumbling through my baseball cards over the last month, pretty much. And, of course, I came across, I don't know, five, six, seven of your baseball cards, whatever the hell. I've been collecting them since I was a little kid. And I kept them, and I like the fact that I still have the cards, or most of them anyway. I think uh, my mother probably got rid of some. She always got into that spring cleaning thing, and she sprung everything right out the garage, which, of course, is a colossal boo. It's because I lost so many things, so many of my personal stuff as a kid. Right. And, you know, everything from baseball, football cards, hockey cards, whatever, to and basketball cards. And of course, I know you're a big basketball guy. And I lost some old bowling trophies, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course, everybody's got their old bowling trophies in a, in a box in the back of the garage. You know, my I, I, I laugh because my parents both they bowled twice a week their whole pretty much their whole life. Yeah, and but you you're know, from Michigan. They, they even got, they even kept their their right? old bowling shirts, you know, with the, the embroidery and all that stuff. But yeah, so it was something. It was something that takes you back. And like you said, I think we all. I mean, you know, I had the baseball cards and all the cards and everything else, and it and it wasn't easy to kind of get them. You right? know, you had to oh, no, you had to go in the you know with the bubble gum and all that stuff, yeah. and and um, and then of course. The, the stars didn't have, you know, compared to the other guys. So, you know, you had to keep buying and buying and buying, maybe finally get a, a, a star once in a while. But what you had, uh, I think I Don Mossy, I used to have like, you know, you got over 50 of those 
and that wasn't enough to trade for one star. So, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it, it was a way for us to, to love baseball when we – not like now where you can see every day and you can and all that kind of stuff. So you're right. That, that was um, – that was so fun to grow up that way and imagine what it was like. And, you know, I was blessed to, to get to the, to get to go out there and stand on that field and uh, play and, and entertain and, and listen to what other people thought of it. And then I could go right back to the wall. Heck, I'll tell you what I thought when I was growing up, just the same thing as you would. And what a thrill. And I think we appreciated it so much. You know, the guys I played with um, that, there wasn't any other way but to go out hard. You know, we never took days off like they do now. Or, you know, it was like tech. If you took a day off or you asked for a day off back then, they gave you a bus ticket to go home. So, you know, it was, it was just a, it, I think, probably, see if, it, you know, talking to people that didn't get to play, not very many people did get to, to the big league level, but they all say the same thing. You know, it was part, they got to be part of the game just through the baseball cards and the stats and, you know, what loves to watch on Sunday on Sundays. Well, when I was growing up, the only way you knew anything was the Sunday paper had the staff. Well, you know, you know Daryl, and, and so so but otherwise you had to do, you had to read the box score every day and all that kind of stuff, and uh, which is a good way to learn too. So, so right, that, that's that's the beauty of the game still going on. You know, if I had, if I still had. My baseball cards, I had some of them, but some of the old baseball and football cards. You know, growing up in Chicago, they always load you up with your local players from the card companies, right? Now, you were, you're from Pasadena originally. But you think about, you know, the players that you were going to get in your bubblegum packs, your wax packs. And so for us in football, of course, of course, we got all of our Chicago Bears players. And back then, I remember I must have had 20 or 30 Walter Payton rookies. Boy, if I had just one of those now, those cards are worth $81,000 each. Imagine that. Show me the money! Yeah, but if you would have had all yours, the, the 50 that you had, it wouldn't be so valuable. It's because we all got rid of all the, the cards, and there's not very many of them left. Which right. I, I guess that's the uniqueness of the whole thing, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's, I, um, I don't have any of those you, left. Yeah, well, so how many guys did you ever get to meet anybody when you were young? Or did you ever, you know, run into somebody at the store or, any, you know, any of those kind of guys? You know, that's, I think that was kind of the dream of growing up and be like, oh, man, what if I got to meet this guy? So Okay, so and, and I've got three minutes left in the segment. I'm going to finish this segment out with this story. So when I was about eight years old, I used to cut through the Ford dealership. That was two blocks from my house on my way home from school because they had the coldest water fountain in town. Right, they figured they were making money. Right, and at eight years old. What do you, what do you know? Right. Well, the good news is that I would go there and I would go get a nice cold drink of water out of the fountain there, and I'd go in the side entrance on a street called Grove, the street that I grew up on, and and I would usually walk through and say hi to the sales guys and whatnot. You know, here's this pesky kid coming in to get cold water again. Well, one day I went and did that. I got my water. It was so hot. I wiped my mouth with my arm i never forget this and then after i got done yeah you know, wearing a ball cap like i do every day i guess because i have a, a lack of hair right but nonetheless so i went and i wiped the sweat from my brow and just wiped the water from my mouth and I, this guy called me up he, eric called for me he goes hey you hey i'm talking to you come over here and i'm looking around like me i don't know if you could see me because your camera is dark right now yeah Right. So, yeah, no, so here, so here we go. So I'm like, okay. So I walk over there. My eyes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because when I got next to him, the guy goes, have a seat, sit down. I want to talk to you. It was Ernie Banks. Right. Oh, man. oh, I know. And so here, here's this eight year old kid and my eyes are as big as pizzas. Right. Cause that's what we have in Chicago. We have good pizza. So my eyes are as big as pizzas and I'm talking Ernie Banks. It's just me and him talking about Little League Baseball yeah. and whatever. What a great guy. What a great experience. Now, back then when I was about eight, I rooted for both teams in Chicago, right? And, and I didn't know any better because I didn't realize what the Cubs always did with their great players, always dealt them off to everybody. Nonetheless, nonetheless, that was a glorious moment, probably my best moment as a kid, 
sitting there and I'm talking to Ernie Banks. And he was such a nice guy. Just as you saw him to the day, the last day he was on TV in any interview or whatnot, he was always great with the people. The people loved him. He loved the people. What did he always want to do? He wanted to play too. Let's play too, didn't he? Sure. Well, yeah, he probably hung out in the store waiting for somebody like you to come along so he, so he could tell baseball stories. What a great experience in here in our last 30 seconds. Gerald, I have to say that still today is my best experience with anything around baseball, whatever, wherever, it doesn't matter. That was as good for me as it possibly could get. In fact, when we come back from break, Daryl, I want you to reach down deep into the memory and I want you to tell everybody maybe one or two of your greatest baseball stories as a kid. We'll be back in just a minute. A few minutes, that is. Here on the Sports Circus with the great Daryl Evans, World Series champion, all-star. Maybe at some point he could be a Hall of Famer. You never know. Back in a few. Don't go anywhere. Attention business owners, you and your customers are listening to this right now. Face it, every business needs customers, even yours. The Sports Circus is a primetime nationally syndicated program that's carried on ABC, NBC, CNBC, and Westwood One News affiliates, plus CBS, Fox, and NBC sports affiliates across North America with coverage from Hawaii to New York. Also, the Sports Circus is available to the 180 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, and the Sports Circus gets about 4 million website visitors per month, which could click through your website and bring sales. The Sports Circus provides great content featuring celebrity guests from sports and entertainment to our audience every weekday, which your company could greatly benefit from by increasing your visibility, foot traffic, eyeballs to your website, and calls from potential customers. Call us right now at 702-799-9935. Again, 702-799-9935. Or email us at info at thesportscircus.com. That's info at thesportscircus.com. Drive your sales today by advertising with The Sports Circus. Hello, Americans. It's Uncle Sam here. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes to the IRS or state, don't worry. I've got important news that may help you negotiate a lower tax bill. In today's economy, the IRS has released a variety of new rules and is offering more flexible terms to help Americans looking to settle their IRS debt. If you apply today, we may be able to lift your wage garnishments and release a freeze on your bank assets or business. Our team of tax professionals can resolve your case and stop collection actions against you. Even if you've been audited or haven't filed a return in years, they can help. Call right now and find out if you qualify to settle your IRS debt for far less than what you owe. Pick up your phone right now and call us for a free $500 IRS tax review. Don't wait. Here's the number. Call right now. 800-950-2049. 800-950-2049. 800-950-2049. For the last time, that's 800-950-2049. Can your IRA stand up to the next financial crisis that our top economists are saying is at our doorsteps? By allocating a percentage of your IRA into physical gold and silver with a tax-free rollover, you can diversify and safeguard your holdings from turbulent markets and economic downturns by putting your IRA back on the gold standard. Find out how to safeguard your assets with a tax-free rollover with a Genesis Gold IRA, the only IRA that can hold physical precious metals. Call now for your free gold and silver report. Protect your IRA today with one simple phone call and learn how to qualify for up to $10,000 in free silver. Call Genesis Gold Group, empowering faith-driven stewardship. 800-932-5517. 800-932-5517. 800-932-5517. That's 800-932-5517. You're listening to the Sports Circus, and I'm Mike Golick. Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm Roy Firestone. Now it's time to throw it back to Sal. Whoa! 
Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the AMP TV studio, AAMP TV. This segment brought to you in part by our friends over at the American Business Trust Company, helping companies with strategy, sales and marketing, capital resources, and establishing companies with physical locations or on the internet. Give them a call. Find out more on how to fund your company, how to staff your company, how to get your company off the ground. In fact, why don't you give them a call at 702-799-9935, 702-799-9935. I may pick up the phone. You never know. Or email them at info at abtrustco.com. That's info at abtrustco.com. Nice round of applause for that. And welcome back to everybody watching on TV, listening in on radio, watching the live stream. We're everywhere. You can't get away from us, even those on the Mars rover. Back here with Daryl Evans, World Series champion, all-star third baseman, playing the hot corner, 21 years of the league. How many years did you manage? Was it 20 years, too? You were also a manager in, in uh, professional baseball? Uh, well, a, a coach and a manager. But, yeah, you know, my, I, I wanted – I. I always wanted to be a manager. Um, you know, after you play for a few years and stuff, and it's like, well, man, I, you know, you, <coughs> you kind of got to bite your tongue sometimes. You know, you're sitting there in the, in the dugout and you're looking over at your manager and going, what in the world were you doing? What are you thinking? <laughs> so I, I, you know, it was like that. That got me the fire of going, you know what, I'd love to, man, you know, at the end, to inspire people. Because the big thing about playing so long is we got to learn so much. Just think from so many people, every year I got to learn something new about baseball. And, and, and certainly when you're younger and stuff, you, you, you're you soaking it all in. Right. And after a while, you're, you're okay to, to voice your opinion and go, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I know you could talk about that earlier in your show about why things you know why things we talked about that earlier is like you know botting in the in the early innings and so because if you you know if you bought man if your, your lead up man's supposed to be your best fastest guy the second guy it used to be is like well he's got to handle the bat and it's like uh well that never made any sense because in the first inning you're gonna bunt him over because if you bunt him over the leadoff man gets on second base. You got one out, and you got your best hitters coming up. The third hitter, who now the pitcher has a base open, so he doesn't really have to pitch to him. And if he if, and if he ends up walking him, now he's got first and second, and you got the fourth or fifth guy. And if they hit a ground ball, you're out of the inning. That's right. So there's so many of those little things that they're just like baseball is still the same. You know, it's like was and this is the way that and it's and it, <clears throat> it's so much different depends on your person now more than anything else so so I, I i always had a thirst to manage i never really got a chance except in the minor leagues uh which is disappointing but um so but when you're man when you're in the minor leagues managing is the same it doesn't matter where it's at and it's kind of fun because you got like like i said you got younger players more inexperienced so there's more teaching moments actually and right. uh, and they're not going to talk back to you. They might right. be like me sitting in the <laughs> dugout and going, "What the right. heck are you thinking?" But they're probably not. Gonna, you know, they're going to listen to you. So I and, and that continued. I think what kept me and the guys to play for a long time because we loved the game. We didn't lose our love for the game or anything. You know, when when we were like young, we loved the game. When you're 30, you love the game, but other people are telling you, "Well, yeah, you better hurry because you know you're going to." You're gonna fall apart here. You're getting old, right? And you can't play anymore. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not true. So, so your love for the game never ends. And I think one of the things that was that motivated me the most was when I went to work. There was something I was gonna learn, something I was gonna learn, something new, no matter what, whether it was playing out in the front yard or it was playing high school or it was playing this game or the other. I could always see there was always something that was gonna come from baseball. And, and and you had to be prepared to be the the one that already knew what to do when those moments came up. So you were telling me, I mean, I love your show and all that kind of stuff because you got the greatest music. You know, I, I mean, 
I grew up in heck. We loved going to going to a circus. Heck, what one would come into town once a year, you know? And it was like, and but it reminds me of how they play the game now. Sometimes, <clears throat> you know, you watch the highlights on TV, and they should have the circus theme on some <laughs> other stuff. Because think about right? what do they show? They show the big moments, and then they show the stupid stuff they do every day. And you would think that. After all these years, 150 years we've been playing, you would think that they would be better at that, you know, because they say that these guys are bigger, stronger, faster. Uh, if that was the case, they'd be doing better than they're doing. But they, but the one thing about it is they can't. They can't. They're not smarter. They're 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 not as prepared. They're not. They make more mistakes, and we overlook them. So but much they're not more. practicing. I mean, if you made a mistake back then, you were told about it. You know, you you were accountable. Daryl, they're not no. practicing. They're not practicing. No, no. And here, not, here's a, here's well, a perfect yeah, well, example. Well, they're not practicing the right way because they don't practice that. Here's a perfect See, that's example. Boring. That's boring to them. But the higher you go in baseball, the more importance it takes on. Daryl. That that's the difference. The ones that make the least mistakes win. Daryl. That's the difference between uh, the major league teams. And, right. you know, we got some te- we got, you know, we got three or four teams that, you know, probably, you know, you, if you play less than 400 baseball, why? You're supposed to be so talented and everything, but apparently you're not that talented. And so it's, it's kind of frustrating to watch the games that, and it makes it easier for the good teams to beat the, the other teams and beat them up all the time because they're going to make the most mistakes. So it's, uh, you know, it's such a cerebral game and uh, it's hard to, it's hard to focus. I think, I guess for most people to focus all the time, but you know, I went to work and it was like, are you kidding me? I'm going to be out there for four hours, five hours. And I, I'm not going to focus. I, you know, it's like, and if you didn't, you, you, you were held accountable. Okay. You know, so so that's, um, you know, I grew up that way. You know, I grew up, like I said, you know, in Pasadena. We had the, heck, they had some spring training games out there at Brookside Park, which is now, which is the ballpark that's been, it's across the street from the Rose Bowl, and it's been there forever, and it was called Brookside Park, and they had the Pirates and the Cubs had spring training back in the 20s and 30s, and Ford and some, they played some games like that. And one of the things that was great was it was always major league players that that were in the area, and on the weekends they play games there too. So I could go, like you said, what I'm growing up, heck, I could go down to this park or several places in Southern California, and major league players were playing in the off season, you yeah. know, and they were they were they were accessible, so yeah. they were more like they weren't. Like you said, they weren't a loop. They didn't act that way. All right. They were trying to teach everybody. All right. Hold, hold that thought for a second. I had to have an explosion get in there to, to break your stride for a moment. Our, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. No, that's okay. It's all right. Just watch for the cues and whatnot. We're set. Yeah, everybody yeah. on TV okay. could see it. So we have one of our guys from – oh, he's, he's still an ongoing – participant with the sports circus our former full-time producer colonel bucky and he's a big cincinnati guy right but he wants to know how was it playing for sparky anderson answer that question in one minute then we're gonna have to go to break okay oh in one minute um well he was a hall of fame manager i guess but the best thing about sparky i guess was that he could handle great players you know, they had the big red machine, and then he had our teams and uh, won with them. But, uh, you know, he also lost 100 games in, in a few seasons, too. So so I guess he was the epitome of what it's like, to, the, the little bit of line of how good, uh, what the difference is, and I think it's personality more than anything else. Let the good players play. Um, try to teach the young players how to, to watch them and sit back and let the talent pretty much dictate things and uh he was good at that well think about this in our last uh, last minute of the segment or so here the different teams that are out there with loaded with young talent that the talent is up and that the talent's been up not because they're 
emptying AAA and saying, all right, we're we're really behind the eight ball. We're not going to win anything this year. But what about the idea of the teams that bring the kids up? And Cincinnati's one of those teams that the kids have been up all year and they're playing very, very well. They've been playing well. They're only a, a game out of the last wild card spot. But end of day, you look at there's a bunch of kids up there. Joey Votto's back on the shelf. And, you know, we're rooting for Joey. But it's cool to see the young kids up there and they're competing. Yeah, dog days of summer, they're maybe not used to that long season, right? That extra month, etc. But when we think about a manager or a system that has confidence in the kids, I like that. But I also like the fact that teams need to practice a little bit more, right? Fundamental, fundamental, fundamental. And when we come back from break, I want you to pick up on that fundamentals talk, then get into a story, because remember we said that at the last break when we were going in. But fundamentals are such an important part of this game. People not understanding basic things of the game. And Daryl, there's some things we're going to talk about in the next segment. But I'll tell you what, we're going to go to break right now, take care of a little bit of business for the sports circus back here in a few minutes. And we're going to ask Colonel Bucky to ans- ask another question because he's a big Cincinnati Reds guy. And we're going to try to help him out and everybody else too. Make sure you send your emails if you like info at the sportscircus.com or on the streamer. Send your question there. Back in a few minutes on the circus. Don't go anywhere. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, of the Sports Circus, a primetime, nationally syndicated television, radio, sports, and entertainment show. The Sports Circus covers topics others are too scared to talk about. There's no other primetime show like it on here that'll punch you in the face and you'll beg for more. Join me, Hall of Famers, World Champions, and All-Star Celebrity Guests for Chaos and Controversy here on Lipson and all podcast platforms, plus thesportscircus.com. Remember, folks, it's a circus and we prove it every day. Do you know someone with a drug or alcohol problem? Get help right now. Insurance may cover everything. Stop the drug and alcohol nightmare. Are drug and alcohol problems hitting you too close to home? Get help right now. Insurance may cover everything. 800-831-1560. 800-831-1560. 800-831-1560. That's 800-831-1560. That's the sound of sizzling, dry-aged USDA prime Wagyu and Angus steaks from UppercutChops.com. They're best-in-class filet mignons, New York steaks, and the king of all steaks, the tomahawk and cowboy cut ribeyes are the best in the business. Even their prime Wagyu burgers will likely be the best you've ever had. Browse the full selection of steaks and chops at UppercutChops.com from the comfort of your home or on your mobile device. UppercutChops.com delivers all-natural, dry-aged USDA prime Wagyu and Angus steaks and chops directly to your door. Without the hassle of going to the grocery store and fight crowds to pick from a small selection of average at best meats with injected steroids, fillers, and coloring added to look good. Find out what's for dinner at UppercutChops.com or call 702-799-9935 That's 702-799-9935, 702-799-9935 or make your selection directly at UppercutChops.com. Hello Americans, it's Uncle Sam here. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes to the IRS or state, don't worry. I've got important news that may help you negotiate a lower tax bill. In today's economy, the IRS has released a variety of new rules and is offering more flexible terms to help Americans looking to settle their IRS debt. If you apply today, we may be able to lift your wage garnishments and release a freeze on your bank assets or business. Our team of tax professionals can resolve your case and stop collection actions against you. Even if you've been audited or haven't filed a return in years, they can help. Call right now and find out if you qualify to settle your IRS debt for far less than what you owe. Pick up your phone right now and call us for a free $500 IRS tax review. Don't wait. Here's the number. Call right now. 800-950-2049. For the last time, that's 800-950-2049. Hey, everybody. This is Barry Katz from the Industry Standard Podcast. And you're listening to The Sports Circus with Sal Tuzzolino. Welcome back. 
back to the Sports Circus. I'm your ringmaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas in the AMP TV studio, Double AMP TV. Thanks for everybody joining us on our streaming platforms. Cox, Comcast, Spectrum, Frontier, Time Warner, Wow Cable, Television Affiliates, Hotel Television, and I think we're in 620,000 rooms, 650,000 rooms, something like that, some crazy number. Nonetheless, thanks for everybody joining us there. We gain about 4 million impressions per hour in itself. That in, That's madness, if you think about it, folks. That's about 300,000 impressions per five minutes. Maddening. All right. This segment is brought to you in part by our friend Daryl Evans baseball situation. Daryl, what do you got going on in California? Well, um, we talk about I well, I grew up and uh, at John at, and I went to high school, John Muir High School in Pasadena. Wait a minute. And, Wait a minute. Yes. Wait, I want you to talk about the baseball camp first, then the story. Oh, oh, well, well, my son, we have a baseball, a, an academy. That's the one. But I'm not always, I'm, I, I don't, I live in Texas, so I, I don't get to spend as much time out there. But my, but he just had, uh, he teaches and uh, uh, hitting mostly and stuff like that. And we, and he just had three, three guys sign or draft it. So it's really a lot of fun. I, I was, I talked to a couple of them. Um, yesterday, both of them, and or two of them, and they were, you know, it's, it's like they're your kids. You know, you see them develop and everything else, and something clicks with them, and they and they make this jump ahead of everybody else, pretty much. Uh, they both said, you know, that the, the organizations loved them, and they were like, how did you guys make it to a uh, 15th or 16th rounder? How did you guys? Yeah, but so, so uh, put, of course, the coaches had never seen them, but but they're so much more advanced because um, we allow them to talk and we, we, we want to hear their ideas and we certainly don't teach one way. And we, and you know, right away, it's like, you know, no, um, you're going to learn. Well, the first question I ask all the people, no matter where they're at, even little kids, where did you learn how to hit? And they all go, eh, maybe my dad, my mom, my grandpa, my uncle, whatever, my coach, whatever. And so then the second question is, could they hit? And they don't usually answer that question with a yes. Most of them like, oh, I don't know. Or, yeah, I think he played high school or something. So so we try to put in perspective is that, okay, the coaches are there, wherever, whatever your level you're at, but, but you're only learning a certain amount from them and you may already know more than they know. But so in the long run, you end up teaching yourself. I mean, you, you, and, and that's why baseball is so hard because nobody does it the same. Everybody's different. You do it depending on, of course, your body and your maturity and your age and your experience and, and all those kind of. So it, it teaches us to be really flexible and to give them a chance and let them answer the questions and be able to talk to us. And maybe we can't answer those questions, but we make sure that they're, that they were available for that. And then let them go. And they're going to call us back and, or whatever, wherever they go, they're going to ask our opinion again. So it's really fun and it, and it's works and it works. It worked okay. when I was playing and it works now. Okay. Daryl, I want you to talk about how people can learn about the Academy. How could, who do they contact? Do you have a phone number or a web address, anything? How could they get in touch with your son and maybe have their kids or maybe they want to participate in it? Well, I'm going to have to. I don't have that available right offhand here, but we'll do it on another show. They can email. Put it through. They yeah. can email info at the sportscircus.com if they want to find out. What do you think yeah. about that? Okay, so we'll, and we'll, we'll give them all the information and all that kind of stuff. It's... Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I apologize that I don't have it at, uh, right in front of me. That's okay. But, okay, uh, on with your story, because loyal listener Lisa wants a story. Okay, so Lisa, so when I was growing up, I went to John Muir High School. And you would think that maybe I might be the most famous alum from there, or maybe especially in baseball, right? But um, Jackie Robinson is the same high school Jackie Robinson went to. So, 
and my parents went to school with him at the same time. My dad and my uncles played played ball with him on the same teams and played against him and knew him and all that stuff growing up and everything else. So um, all of a sudden, it's like, well, of course, I was too young, and, you know, he wasn't around. He was gone. But then I realized I, I, my, my uncle, when he was in high school, one of the pitchers on his team was a got, – got to pitch for the uh, Braves, the, the, uh, got to the major league, the Atlanta Braves, or, I mean, Milwaukee Braves, for one year. But I was the bat boy for that team, so I didn't think of Herb Ibov. Like, you know, until he got to the major league. And he's playing on my with my favorite team, the Braves. And all of a sudden, it's like, hey, he just got called up to the major leagues. And you're going, oh, yeah, man, I used to, you know, I play catch with him and all this kind of stuff. So, so then it was like, okay, he's going to take us to the game when they get to uh, play the Dodgers. So I got to go to a major league game knowing a major league player that, heck, he had a baseball card, so he was great. And I got to go to the game. He got us tickets and everything. And uh, so I got to, we got to go down there. We don't get to go on the field, but we got to go down there and, and wave at everybody else and go, hey, look, at, we're down here, and this guy loathes us and all this kind of stuff. So... So it was the best. All of a sudden, it was like, you know what? When I watched him warm up, though, I, on, he, he was starting that night. And back then, they used to warm up in front of the dugouts. I, you know, the, so you could see him not in the bullpens. They, the starting pitchers used to warm up. Um, I don't know if people know, but you know, in front of the dugouts. And you could watch a pitch and everything. And I'm going, well, you know, the, he, he's not really that good. I mean, I saw him <laughs> in pitch in high school, you know. I'm sitting there going, I, I, you know, we, we're, I'm going into college. You know, I'm going to just finish high school. I'm going to junior college. And, so, and, and, and it was like, it was so funny because to see him compared to the other guys and you thought, oh, man, he's throwing 100 miles an hour. But maybe he wasn't. But it it was so, it was, I, I don't know. I, I was lucky. I guess I got to see that comparison. And then I listened to him after the game, after the game, talked to him and everything else and tell he was telling us how scared he was and how nervous and all those kind of things that you would never, like you said, you heard Ernie Banks talk to you about stuff that you would never know. But I got to be around that kind of stuff probably because of being in California. We used to have at this ballpark in, in uh, um, across the street from the Roseboro, Brookside Park, which is now Jackie Robinson Field, they used, they used to play softball, overhand softball during the winter time. And we had Irv Norn and Ralph Kiner and guys like all kinds of these guys would play against each other. Um, and nobody knew it, but we were bat boys all the time for all these guys. So, so those stories, and, and I don't know if people know too, my, my mom played professional softball. Two of my aunts played professional softball when it wasn't a big deal back then, but it was, you know, it was an underhand fast pitch. He, she played in Arizona and New Mexico and all these kind of places. And then two, three of my uncles played professional baseball in the minor leagues. My grandfather played in AAA, but he was, he played, he pitched for Mexico because uh, he was the best pitcher in Mexico. So the, so the Mexican president wouldn't let him come and play in the States. So I grew up on that stuff. So, I stood out to my mom, but the kids would always play at our place because they wanted my mom to come out and play with us because she was a professional softball player. So I had all these, um, you know, to me, I guess it wasn't, it wasn't unusual, but obviously it's unusual for all this thing, but it was, it was a, it was a, I, I think I was supposed to be around that. I was chosen to be able to do that kind of stuff and be able to talk to all those people. So, it was an Ernie Banks kind of story, but it was constant every day and kept more and more people would be around. So, um, you know, that was your calling. I ever met those guys was that was the greatest. Like you said, it was a big deal, but they were always nice to me. So it, it was, you know, it was 
It was what we all were. We were speechless. Yeah, and you know, as a kid, in our, in our last minute of this segment here, as a kid, you're living it. You don't realize you're living it. In your case, it was an ongoing daily thing. Whereas I had a one-time trip to the moon sitting with Ernie Banks, and that was incredible. But you were actually living this movie, and it kept going on and on and on for the better part of your life. It's still today. Now you have all those relationships, all those experiences, the playing time, the coaching time. You've done all this for most of your life. And what a wonderful thing to be able to be around such a great game and do what you love for your life for the most part. And then, you know what, you hang your hat up and call it a day. Back here in just a few minutes with World Series champion Daryl Evans in just a few moments. Don't go anywhere. Lots more to come. Ah, Tim Beats point of the old ballpark, friends. Hi, pop fly. That one be a home run in a phone booth. I don't know what the big deal about Cracker Jack is. Did you ever go and buy a pack of Cracker Jack thinking you'd get a prize and find no prize <laughs> in the box? Here's the pitch. That might not sound important to some people, but when, you, when you're a little kid, especially from humble origin, and they cheat you out of a prize, there's a bouncing ball. Second baseman has a Barbary over the first. It's hard to think in laudatory terms of the product. <laughs> I Too think if there was an occasional box of Cracker Jacks that found no prizes for uh, the, the, the for the little Harry Carey many years ago. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> that boy when a box of Cracker Jack to me meant a lot of money. Here's a pitch bounce foul. That's the most asinine marketing I've ever heard of. One ball, one strike. These guys say, "Well, you you sing about Cracker Jack." I said that. I only sing it because it's in the song. Here's a pitch foul back. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised, even to this day, some youngsters who buy a box of Cracker Jack don't find a prize in the box. One ball, two strikes, two out. Well, if you're going to talk about our congressman being crooked, here's a pitch foul out of play. Why not talk about commercial products that don't do what they represent to do? There's a smash to Squires. He's got it. One, two, three. Nothing to front. We're going to the bottom of the seven now to score. All tied up. Milwaukee four. The White Sox four. Hey! Everybody! All right, Nancy. Let me hear you. I missed that. I, I didn't get to hear all those things. Root, root for the white sun. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes you around at the old ball game. There's a drive. Way back. It might be. It could be. This crowd is wild. Hey, this is Tommy John, and you're listening to the Sports Circus. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome back to the Sports Circus. I'm your remaster, Sal, live from Las Vegas from the Amp TV studio, AAMP TV. Folks, make sure you like, subscribe, and follow the Sports Circus on all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, you name it, we're there. Even YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe to our videos and whatnot and our audio feeds. There's lots of cool stuff out there. And, of course, we're on Apple and Spotify and iHeartRadio and google and audible all of those plus many more so make sure you like subscribe and follow to those also make sure you check out our partners page at the sportscircus.com one of those is the college of southern nevada athletics csncoyotes.com for upcoming games and events that's csncoyotes.com for the college of southern nevada athletics yes all right back here with Daryl Evans, World Series champion, playing the hot corner with the Giants, the Tigers, the Bravos. And you know, Daryl, as a world champion, you've been in this rodeo. You played for great management. You played on great teams. You played with great players. How about a great Henry Aaron story? Tell everybody about, first of all, how long you played with Hank Aaron and where you played in the lineup, where you hit in the lineup. And give me a great story. You told me a bunch of them, but I want the audience to hear something. Well, <clears throat> I was blessed to uh, play with him almost, well, five years, almost five and a half years. Uh, my first two years in 1969 and 70, I was up and down in the minor league. Wasn't there all the time, but in 69, I was on the team. We, we lost to the Miracle Mets in the playoffs, and we lost in three games. The Seaver... Um, and Ryan and uh, who did I say? Uh, Kuzman, I guess. Um, and Hank hit a home run in each game. And, they, you know, sit there and watch this guy that I believe was chosen to be who he was. And, and he was the person that was chosen to beat Babe Ruth's record and do all the things that he's done. But all the magnificent things that he's done, he was, he was I think, the key was probably as humble as anybody I'd ever met. You know, he grew up in this, he grew up with uh, bro brothers and sisters. He was out on his own. He went through the minor leagues and, and all that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden, when he got to the major league, um, it was like, well, Willie Mays. You know, if you talk about the best players of all time, you know, people say Mays, Mantle, all those kind of other guys. And then you go, yeah, but Hank holds almost every record. Uh, offensive record there is and one um you know how I, I many gold gloves uh 24 all-star teams um so i remember <clears throat> him and maybe this this will tell you about spring training my my first spring training and the first day in spring training you're there for five or six or ten days maybe before you start playing exhibition games and we were in west palm beach and we played an exhibition game First day was against the world champion Baltimore Orioles. Exciting as can be and all that kind of stuff. I mean, dreams that you dream about and everything else. And I'm sitting in the dugout with Orlando Zapata, Hall of Famer, Phil Nico, Hall of Famer. Hoyt Wilhelm was on that team, Hall of Famer. Um, <clears throat> Eddie Matthews, Hall of Famer, was a hitting coach. <clears throat> Excuse me, and, and Hank. But Hank overshadowed everybody. On both teams, uh, the you know the Orioles had all these great stars and everything. So I remember sitting down at the end of the bench with all the other rookies or the young guys because we were still in awe of all these other players. Well, Eddie Matthews came walking down and goes, "Hey, why are you sitting down here? Get your down to the other end of the dugout and watch these guys. Listen to what they say." And Hank and I were like, "Oh man, we can. Yeah, okay, I can." So we sat down there, and I remember, so the bottom of the first inning, we're the home team, the bottom of the first inning, Hank's coming up, nobody on. Uh, uh, all right, let's see, he gets up there, one man on, he's in third. And uh, I think it was Palmer was pitching, it was Jim Palmer, I think. So um, he gets, he hits a fly ball to left field, but he kind of gets jammed, and you know he got jammed, he didn't hit it perfect, got jammed a little bit. And Eddie's sitting there with next to him, Matthews, and he's going, watch this. 
So Hank was always this guy that he never let you show his emotions. I don't know if they, well, people didn't see him play, but you know he wouldn't put his helmet on until he's walking up to home plate. He he was calm as can be. You didn't think he was going to do anything, but I like I was talking to uh, one of my buddies, Bill Bordley, about this and how many, you know, he hit a home run almost every fourth game. So he was this guy that you expected was going to do. So he pops up to left field. So he runs the first, comes back down, and he's going to come back to the dugout. And I was like, I, I really never seen him. Well, how is he going to react? Well, he just walked by and and takes his helmet out, puts it gently into the bat rack and all that kind of stuff. And, and then he went down in the tunnel. Uh, and I didn't realize. So he went down the tunnel and everything. And then now he comes back out. And he walks by. And Eddie looks up to him and he goes, you got him in your trap now, huh? And Hank had this big, he had a great infectious smile anyway. And he smiled at Eddie. I didn't know what he was talking about. So Hank goes sits down, waits till he's going to get his next at bat, couple, you know, couple innings or whatever. Now he's going up there on non-deck circle, and Eddie's going to watch it. Same thing. So this time he hits a home run to left field. Now this is his second at bat in spring training. But he got jammed on the same pitch. But this time, he hit that same pitch over the fence. And like I said, Eddie's hitting me. See that? See what? And I'm like, wow. That's, that's, wait a minute. No. That, that. So he comes back in the dugout, and, and, and Eddie, and he, and he winks at Eddie. I'm watching him. I'm watching Hank. Ed, he winks at Eddie and sits down and goes, yeah, I got him again. So it was all about, which is some, I mean, does anybody ever think that? Are you kidding me? That's how good he was, was that he, he, he was like, I got him in a trap. I know what they're going to try to do with me because they, they think I'm old and I can't hit anymore. And because they jam me, so now they're going to pitch me inside again. And, of course, he was best at making adjustments. And it was a, it was a, I would have never thought about that. Of course, yeah, it was. You no, know, it was. It was all mental. You know, it, it was all so that he knew now. And though all those pitchers, not just Palmer, but when of course he was in the in the American League, so he was going to face him during the season anyway. But, but all those pitchers on the other team all saw that too. So he was that guy that you just were so. Yeah, you were in awe of him. But it was so, he made it look so easy, but it was, he was doing something that no one else could ever do better. Uh, you know, I talked, I used to kid him all the time too, and I used to lock her right next to him and everything. And he, you know, he's, he was a, you know, we liked to kid him. He, he loved to laugh. He loved to be the butt of the jokes, stuff like that. And because he knew he had, what his status was, he wanted to make everybody comfortable. He came up to me right away when I was a rookie. And you know what? I mean, I, I think people think, oh, yeah, you get rasped and all that kind of stuff. You know, they do that. But they do that to test you to see how you're going to react. Because, and so, you know why? Because they want every player on that team has to be as good as he can be for us for us to win a pennant. So, yeah, it's, it's hitting and it's all that kind of stuff, but it's trying to educate everybody on how to get as good as you can be and so that was to me that was the the essence of hank he had the most respect of any player because the players talk players show you they know who they respect across the field and you know it's almost like the pitchers would you know when hank i hit third in front of him a lot and they'd be looking it was funny because they they would be looking over in the on deck circle all the time while they're pitching to me, <laughs> and like, oh, Hank's coming up next. So so accordingly, so he affected so much of the game and the respect of the players, and of course because he was such a class act, um, he he reflected how baseball players are supposed to be. So um, it was it was a privilege to be. I was one of the great things about going to work, going to work and seeing the best and being around the best, maybe the best player of all time. I did kid him before, though, 
because I told him, no, it's not, Babe Ruth is better, and you know the stats and all that kind of stuff, but just like we were talking before, but Babe Ruth was also won 199 games pitching. So, so Hank, he laughed and said, yeah, maybe he got me there. But <laughs> all right. being, being able to go through watching him approach, how can, how can you approach Babe Ruth's record and just blow by it? I mean, he didn't even, you know, it didn't, he wasn't off for a month. Um, and, and then you go, yeah, man, I need to get that out of the way. Cause that's, that's too much pressure. Because I got to listen to everybody every day. There was press conference before and after the games and all that. Kind of, and he looked at it as like, ah, I'm getting this out of the way because then I don't have to answer all these questions. I go out and play, have fun playing baseball. So it was, it was to be with a guy like that. Um, of course, it doesn't get any better than that, but uh, you know, I was blessed to be able to do that and um, to be associated with that. You know, I hit third in front of him most of the time, which is an honor, of course. Um, and, uh, my job learned that right away was to get on base for Hank and once in a while I'll hit a home run or whatever, you know, I was trying to get on base. So I, I, you know, I walked a lot, led the league and walks in front of him and some people go, oh, well, how'd you do that? You know, you probably, you got better pitch because you hit in front of Hank. Well, I got enough respect to know that, okay, maybe I might hurt them too. So. But it was, it was every day it was like you had this guy walk up there, you know, when I'm up in, in, the, in the plate, I know he's on deck and there were, there's more worried about him while they're pitching to me, which was kind of blows you away if you look back on, on how respected that man was. Well, you know, hitting 414 home runs in Major League Baseball is insane to imagine for anybody. And let's face it, Daryl, you have done a lot of things that people haven't done. And we want to thank you for joining us on the circus today. And, of course, you're always welcome back because you are one of our baseball insiders. And we want you back again real soon. And I know you'll be willing to do that because we have lots of stories. And, geez, we talked about oh, hours got on the phone anyway. we lots to talk about with the pen races. Yeah. I know. I know. Who knows? Maybe we'll come right back and do another show on that. Folks, that's going to do it for today's show here on the Sports Circus. We'll see you next time right here on your favorite station. So for Daryl Evans, World Series champion, also our third baseman, I'm your ringmaster, Cell, and we'll see you next time. So long, everyone. the sound of sizzling, dry-aged USDA prime Wagyu and Angus steaks from UppercutChops.com. They're best-in-class filet mignons, New York steaks, and the king of all steaks, the tomahawk and cowboy cut ribeyes are the best in the business. Even their prime Wagyu burgers will likely be the best you've ever had. Browse the full selection of steaks and chops at UppercutChops.com from the comfort of your home or on your mobile device. UppercutChops.com delivers all-natural, dry-aged USDA prime Wagyu and Angus steaks and chops directly to your door. Without the hassle of going to the grocery store and fight crowds to pick from a small selection of average at best meats with injected steroids, fillers, and coloring added to look good. Find out what's for dinner at UppercutChops.com or call 702-799-9935 at 702-799-9935, 702-799-9935 or make your selection directly at UppercutChops.com.